How does one describe the times we are living in? They seem precarious, uncertain, hateful, angry, dangerous. We seem to get up to noise and sleep to noise. The noise is not just coming from out there, from others. It's coming from within. There's clutter and there is rumbling and there is, in all this, there is no learning. It's, it's reactive. And we somehow seem to be within this mess, trying to grapple with ideas of culture, ideas of who we are, identities. Who is that person? Who are they? Who is the outsider? Who belongs? These are everyday rumblings within us. These are everyday conversations we are having with family based on newspaper reports, based on WhatsApp forwards, based on false news, based on Twitter. This is the culture that we are living in. I'm calling it culture because it is a kind of culture. And it's cutting across generations. It's cutting across society, across genders, across castes, fates. It's just that each person is at a different power position and hence is either receiving the oppressive nature of what we are dishing out or is participating in the violence. We are now living in a culture of violence. So how does one respond to it? It's important that we respond every day. It's important that we, that we say things that go beyond these divisive ideas. It's important. But there's something much more that's important. We have to seriously reflect about, the, about these questions. We have to reflect about what do we mean by saying we are Indian? We say we are proud to be Indian, but what does it mean? Is it just one line within which we live? Is there an idea of India, truly? Let's ask that question. Not just historically, but culturally. Is there an India within you and me? Is there an India within every citizen? Does every citizen feel as Indian as I feel? Do they feel differently Indian? Do they feel that they don't belong? Are they being told they are not Indian? These are all the contradictions that we have to face up to. I'm a musician. I have sung from the age of six. I sing a form of music, Carnatic music, that's supposed to epitomize the idea of Indian culture. I have been told this. I believed it. And I still believe it in some ways. But what did I really represent? What do I represent? What is this culture? You know, we keep reading about India as being the land of diverse culture. Um, I myself call it a cradle uh, where multiple cultures came in, mingled, talked to each other, disagreed with each other. There is this deeply sentimental description of India. And in order to battle today, we seem to be running back to sentimentality, back to nostalgia, back to calling out names like Kabir and say, look, that's India. But these are all half-truths, isn't it? Because India is always a complicated place. India is not a seamless, creaseless textile. It is, like every other part of the world, messy. And so when we speak about Indian culture in the past, let's put some reality to it. Let's first agree that human beings are always human beings and we will do what we always do. So when we are facing what we are facing today, we should not just be responding to today or the next two years, but we have to reflect upon the past and the present because we need to think of the next two decades because this has to change. The way we engage with culture has to change now. There's an urgency to it. So what do we do with our past? Do we then say the past is a horrible place where evil things happen? Yes, evil things did happen. The past is a place where people were divided like today. Yes, of course it was. The past was a place where as much as we sang beautiful songs, we also made sure some people couldn't sing songs. Of course we did. But isn't that contradiction really India? 
the existence of that contradiction. That existence of the most wonderful sayings from the wonderful sages of, and, the, and the saints of various faiths and the violent acts of some, the violent thoughts of some, the othering of people. And they belong to every, every section of society. So, as a person of song, sometimes when I sing a song, I am reflecting about this. I am reflecting about what does the song say? What does it say about the past? What does it say about me? Am I about myself and about the today? Am I in a way passing on to people who are listening to me just one side, just one angle? How do we get multiple angles together? So let's talk about cultures in a manner that is complex, that is unresolved. It doesn't have to be resolved. But what is this that we are missing today? Because it's true that what we are facing today is imminently different from what we have faced before. I think that's undeniable. So as much as I say all this, let's ask that question too. Why is today so much more precarious than 20 years ago? What is different? What is different is two things. One, we live in times when the people in power, the establishment is ensuring to its fullest capacity that we do not believe each of us have to live together unless we belong to one way of living. This is true. The establishment may not say it itself, it, by itself, it does. Sometimes its various networks operate, bruise people, kill people, abuse people. So here we are facing an establishment-based violence. That's one reason. The other is this poison has gone into every one of us. None of us, including me who is having this conversation with you, is not having the poison within. I have the poison within. I see red. I'm unable to think. I think of somebody as an enemy. I think of somebody who doesn't agree with these ideas as somebody who has to be shut out, who has to be, as they say today, cancelled. Because that's in my head too. We have to face this disturbing truth within ourselves. And for which I think the liberals like me, or what we like to call ourselves, have to reflect about how liberal we've really been. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm not here to point fingers on people. I'm here to talk about my own failings, our own failings, because we don't talk about that. What have we missed? Have we missed anything? When we became independent in 1947, we made many promises to ourselves. I think India was born that day, on probably those two dates to be specific. Then what was before that? Was that not India? I'm not going into this myth of India being an eternal civilization. No, this was a land that was not India, but this is a land of cultures, land of people. But India happens in 1947. Because that's when we resolve to decide who we want to be. Yes, that came from the past before. But it also was a radical moment in the history of this part of the world. A radical moment. Because anybody who reads our constitution, anybody who hears what people said in 1947, would realize that there was a distinct recognition that the past was a place from which we take inspiration, but the present or that moment was also a moment when we say, we cannot accept certain things about our own past, that we are creating a new land, a beautiful new land that was going to embrace a very different culture. That to me is Indian culture. What is in that document called the Constitution of India is Indian culture. And within that comes in the plurality of cultures and diversity. So when we say we're a diverse land, every diversity we talk about must be under the umbrella 
of what I would call Indian constitutional culture. Well, is the Indian constitution perfect? Of course it is not perfect. It's after all written, rewritten, redrafted, changed by human beings. But it's, there are certain essentials, certain callings, certain gifts that we give ourselves that is important to recognize today in these times. But what did we do? What did we do? And the truth of the matter is, the liberals of this country ignored some essential aspects of who we are as people. We can call ourselves a democratic culture. We can call ourselves, like I said, a constitutional culture. But there are cultures within cultures within cultures. And some of those cultures have existed for centuries, for millennia. They operate within the family. They operate within small communities. They operate in regions, in ethnic cities. They operate in these little, little dimensions. And the fact is that the liberals were not willing to engage, I include myself, with certain aspects of this culture. And one fundamental aspect that we have ignored is faith and religion. What has been our discourse, our dialogue, with that inner urge, that urge to believe in something more powerful, universal, universal consciousness, God, an idol, an idea. What has been the liberal conversation with that? It's not enough if we say we embraced every culture, every faith and every religion. It's not enough. It's not enough. And it's not enough, like I said, to go back and, and name people of the past. What has been the contemporary liberal conversation with these complex ideas? Of course, I concede that many of these things are built within oppressive caste and social structures. Of course, that's what makes our conversation even more essential, even more important. But we haven't. So we've just let faith happen. People who believed to do what they did. But what has been the democratic conversation with those worlds? And that's the major part of this country. Why does a person believe? Why is there faith? Because that is hope. That is hope that tomorrow will be better. That is hope that if I'm marginalized, that tomorrow somehow my day will be better when the sun rises that I may earn a few more rupees, that my child may be able to go to school. It's not just an economic problem. It's not a problem just of society. There needs to be hope and faith gives people hope. How have we failed to connect these dots in the way we have spoken to ourselves and our society? We have failed. We have let things just happen because people who counter argue me will, argue me will say, but Everything just happened, but that's the problem. Where is the conversation with that? Where is their respect? That's a very important question I want to ask. Where is their respect for faith within the liberal world? We have got to a point where we've allowed the idea of being liberal or progressive to be a synonym for atheism. Why? They are not connected at all. They're absolutely different ideas. So where is the progressive theistic conversation? Where is the progressive respectful conversation for ritual, for faith, for ways of living? Because, you know, it's very convenient for us, the social elites, to say, I separate religion from culture. I consider myself culturally Hindu or culturally Muslim, but not religiously. Come on, think about it. Think about it. Isn't that privilege to be able to say that? Every other person who doesn't have this privilege connects the two. It's connected. Their art, their song, their theater, their faith, the space, everything is interlinked. So how does one, you know, Pick holes and somehow separate those two things. You can't separate those two things. 
So how does one engage in a conversation with that? Have we? We have not. That's something we have to think about very deeply. How does one build a conversation, a respectful, non-condescending conversation with people of faith? Because we are also judging people of deep faith. There are these two words, right? We think that progressive and conservative are opposites. Are they opposites? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Because within the conservative, there could be certain progressiveness that I, the progressive, do not have. Maybe I don't believe in that chant, in that gospel, or in that hymn, or whatever religion you may belong to. I may not believe in it. But is it just possible that in the repetition of that, in the utterance of that, there is a certain openness that opens in some people? Is it possible? It is possible that that gives that person somehow an ability to to be non-divisive in a way that even I can't be. Is it possible? We have to ask these questions. Because when we don't ask these questions, we push every one of these people into the arms of bigots. We, we almost make sure they run away from us. We make sure that they are caught in the cesspool of anger. I don't blame them. I blame us. I blame you and me. When I say you, I mean people like me for allowing this to happen. So what I'm trying to say is right from independence, I think there has been a great loss and that's 70 years of loss. It's not today and yesterday. The constitutional culture was never an umbrella because if it was an umbrella, then we would have had this engaging conversation. Because the Constitution does not belittle any of this. The Constitution does not disregard any of this. The Constitution is not condescending of people. It does not typecast people as progressive, conservative. The Constitution doesn't call itself liberal. It calls itself equitable, equality, fraternity, justice. These are the words we give ourselves. Not these divisions within political discourse. What about the way I studied in school? That's a very important part of this conversation. What was my school like? What did I read in my school? You know, people will tell me, there was a time when I went to school, we used to sing these songs where we celebrated every religion. And yes, but what was the conversations that we had around it? Our entire schooling system is discriminative. We have private schools and we have public schools. Everyone listening to this conversation knows who goes to the private school and who goes to the public school. Which section of society goes to public school, which section of society go to private school. And the grades within private school, let's keep that aside. Our education system is casteist. Our education system is discriminative and what we study has nothing to do with being good human beings. How do we expect to create generations of people who are sensitive? How do we expect generations of people to understand cultures or culture? We just use these convenient statements of us being this civilization that was a melting pot of multiple faiths and cultures. That's not good enough. It has to be felt here in the heart. I'm a person of music. That's what matters to me. That is it felt. It can't be transactional. It's not enough if people lived in the same mohalla and had transactions with different communities or different people of different caste groups. No. What was their relationship? What did they feel within? If push came to shove, will one group just get together, gang up and hit the other? Yes, they do. We've seen it happening, not just in the last five years, we've seen it happening repeatedly in our history. What have we changed after every one of these incidences? What have we done? Has there been any healing? And what does healing mean? It means that every 
once this something like this has happened, we change the way we learn, we change the way we teach, we change the way we discuss these things, we become more open to these conversations. If anything, we have become more closed and closed and closed and closed to these conversations. I'm talking about children, I'm talking about colleges, I'm talking about schools, not public intellectuals, not academics, not historians, no, not the books. I'm talking about talking. I'm talking about the classroom. We have not changed that. We still have two pages on the constitution. We just still have few lines on every religion. I think all this has to change urgently. Our tone of that discourse has to change. Because it is in that that there is a possibility for the future. It is in these very fundamental changes, the way we embrace, the way we feel, the way we share cultures. What does it really mean to share in somebody else's culture? What does it mean? Or somebody else's faith? I may be a non-believer, but how do I share in the feeling of faith with another person? I'm not here to give you answers to any of this. I don't have answers. I only have doubts. I only have questions. I'm as disturbed as you are. So that's the best I can do. How does one share? How does a believer and non-believer share culture? How do they do that? What is the preciousness that they share? Is there anything? These are the difficult questions. These are the, the gaps that we need to address. Because if we don't do that, we probably are just putting band-aid again. It is the culmination of decades and decades of letting things just be. Turning a blind eye every time something happened beyond that incident. If there was violence, we respond for four months and then we forgot about it. Allowing things to simmer. Allowing people to go away from the liberal conversation, the open-minded conversation, the all-encompassing conversation, allowing people to run away because we were intimidating, we are intimidating, has led to where we are today. I just have a few more things to say before I finish. How does one change what we have today or what we are facing today? How does one change the discourse? How does one think of really a new India? Because I don't really believe that in the larger scheme of things, we really created a new India after 1947. I know people are going to disagree with me, but I'm saying deep inside. Yes, there's been progress. Of course, things have changed and I'll never refute that. A lot of things have changed. Education has happened. People who had no voice have a voice today. Yes, all that's true. I completely agree. But within inside, right deep inside, on how we feel about differences, how do we feel about somebody else, this idea of who's the other, has that really changed within us? Whether it's caste, whether it's religion, whether it's region, has it changed? We live in 2021 and we still use the term Northeast. We rarely speak about every state. The people of Northeast, of Manipur, Meghalaya, Nagaland, Arunachal Pradesh, will come and tell you that they are still othered today. How is that happening? You, let's go have a conversation with people who belong to caste groups that are marginalized. They will tell you that even today, they feel alone. Lonely. Lonely is a better word, not alone. Let's go speak to the Muslims of India, the Christians of India, and ask them how they feel. They will tell you that they feel extremely othered, almost told every day they don't belong. This environment is reality today, not just because of a few years, it's a reality because of a failing, I believe, of seven decades. So what we are seeing today is a compounding of, of a lacking. We have chosen to address certain things when it was convenient and we have chosen not to address certain things when it was inconvenient. This game of convenience and inconvenience 
cultural convenience and cultural inconvenience, religious convenience and religious inconvenience has allowed for us to be facing this monstrosity that we are facing from the establishment and from the people around. I don't think we ever got to a point where we couldn't have a conversation with our family, even if we deferred. Today we are there, which means it's hit so deep. It's tapped into something. Let's recognize that. When somebody has so much anger, I can completely disagree with that anger, and I do. But the fact is the anger is true, right? Now, is the anger entirely generated by external forces or are external forces triggering something that is so deep-seated? How does one change the nature of that? That is our challenge. That deep-seatedness, that deep-seated feeling of power, especially. How does one handle that? How does one engage with it. We will not be able to speak to people who are in the extremes. Of course we will not be able to. I don't think we will be able to. But we can speak to a lot of the people who feel it but don't know why they feel it. They feel it but don't know why. We can speak to the people who are at the receiving end. We should speak to the people at the receiving end and wonder why we didn't do anything. We failed them. We have failed the Dalits of India. We have failed the Muslims of India. We have failed the Christians of India. And we have failed talking to people of faith who, within themselves, I will say are good people, but have been dragged into the gutter. So this is the challenge we have in front of us. I know I didn't say very many happy things and celebrate Indian culture or cultures, because I do believe that in just Painting that picture, there is no introspection, there is no reflection. I may be wrong with the many things I said today, and that is not the problem. You can disagree with that. But I feel very deeply, it's very personal, this conversation. Because as a musician, I sing songs of faith. I sing songs which are not of faith. I sing songs of society. I sing songs of politics. I sing songs of all all kinds. They coexist. But I ask my question to myself, how are these songs talking to each other? Am I as the singer able to create a bridge between these songs? Because these songs represent different cultures, different ways of life. Can there be a respectful exchange between these words and these songs and these melodies and these rhythms? And am I, as the voice of them, giving them the space to breathe and listen to each other? I leave you with the hope that there is sharing between these different ideas of living, of cultures. But let's keep in mind that it is not going to happen automatically. We have to work towards it. Thank you very much. Thank you.